you guys doing another Flickers of Fear review. Uh, if you'll notice, I have the chair here, but Mothman isn't in it. He decided he was going to hang back there of all the thing. It's just, I can't, I try to be like in the middle of the frame because, you know, normally like Tom is here. But I don't know. I'm just not used to like sitting over there where the middle of the frame is. So it's just like, I'm going to do this and I'm just going to like put shit over here like so. So it'll be like all like fucking balanced or whatever. So, you know, sorry if that's weird. But so as I mentioned on my review of the invitation, uh, one thing that I wanted to do this month, uh, to, you know, to a small degree, was I wanted to talk about some movies that I had seen previously and really, really liked. And in a lot of cases had uh, written long blog posts about when I back when I originally saw them. And I wanted to watch them again and review them for this show uh, because I liked them so much the first time. So basically that's what we're doing again today. Like I said, last time I did the invitation and this time I'm doing another movie from 2015, which actually I think I saw this one into in summer of 2017 also around the same time that I watched the invitation because I was watching a lot of newer horror movies around that time period that had come out in the previous five years or so. And this is called They Look Like People. This is not... Okay, I'm going to call this, this is a psychological horror film, but I've seen it like not called a horror film. I would argue with that. At the same time, I can kind of see where people are coming from too, because it's not really a traditional horror film in any sense of the word. But it should be noted though, that this movie is creepy as shit. <laughs> like some, like just the whole atmosphere of it is like creepy as shit, but it's also one of the most human horror movies I think I've ever seen, if that makes any sense, in the sense that it has such empathy for its characters that this is legitimately one of the only horror movies that I think I've ever watched that actually like made me kind of tear up at the end, much like Train to Busan or something like that, which is another one I think I said that about. But this one, the ending of this one is just so uplifting that it just kind of like, it gave me feels. I'm just going to say that right now because it's in, and, and the reason that it does is because the character work in this is just so, so effective and so, so natural. And you really get to know these characters, these two guys, and like, you really get a sense of the parameters of like the friendship that they share, which is kind of at the, like at the heart of this movie, other than all of like the creepy shit going on. And I think that's what really kind of makes this one a cut above. Now, as with most horror movies, this isn't going to be for everybody. Some people might think it's, oh, it's too slow or nothing happens or it's too ambiguous or blah, blah, blah. But I don't know. It's just, I really, really enjoyed this one. And like I said, this is another one that I'm really, really glad that I got to watch again a second time because I liked it just as much, if not more, uh, the second time as the first time I saw it back in 2017. Now, this one this movie, I know I tried not to like spoil too much about the invitation, like about the end and stuff, but this one I think I probably will because I really, really love the ending of this and I really wanted to talk about it a little bit. And um, so it's going to be really, really hard to talk about it without spoiling that because it's kind of like the crux of the whole entire like theme of the movie. So if you want to watch this movie and you don't want anything spoiled, because again, this is one of the movies that's better if you don't really know anything about it going in. So basically just go watch it and then come back and watch this because I am going to spoil the ending and, you know, various uh, plot points and things. It's actually, it was on Netflix, which is where I watched it back in 2017. I'm not sure if it's on there anymore, but um, it's on Tubi for free. Uh, and I believe it's also on Amazon Prime. If you have Amazon Prime, I think you can watch it for free on there uh, as well. I'm not entirely sure because I watched it again on Tubi. But, uh, you know, so go check it out if you're really, really into like creepy, uh, low-key uh, psychological kind of horror. It's like a micro, micro budget, but I don't think that impedes it in any way, shape or form. This is actually the entire project of Perry Blackshear. Uh, he wrote it, edited it, directed it, uh, shot it. He was a cinematographer, everything. So this is very much, and I mean this in the best way possible. This is very much, a, a passion project of Perry Blackshear and his uh, friends that were also in the movie. And so you, it really has that organic, like I said, this kind of natural, you can tell that these, the people in this uh, movie are maybe friends in real life or they hung out in real life uh, because it comes across as just very genuine on screen. So like I said, I really, really like these just independent films that come out just fantastic like this. So 
one of my easily one of my favorite movies uh, horror movies from 2015 uh, and from the past 10 years also so what we have at the very beginning of this uh, there's a guy named Christian and He's kind of like, he has some kind of high techie, like media type job or something like that. They don't really specify. It doesn't really matter. But the implication as it goes on is that he was once kind of like a geek, like in high school or junior high or whatever. And he's still really, really, really insecure. But to sort of compensate for that, he's become... He started like working out, so he got like really muscular and everything. And then he starts listening to all these kind of daily affirmations and things like that, like telling you are a mountain, you are this, that, and the other. And uh, he's talking about it at his job. He's like, oh yeah, and you know, I was like, I'm dominating and all this other kind of stuff. So he's really kind of gone from like an insecure kind of dorky kid to really the the whole other end of the spectrum. But all of those insecurities are still there. Now he lives by himself in a, in an apartment in New York City. Uh, his fiance has uh, recently left. And in fact, it is her voice that we hear like when he's listening to these daily affirmations. Uh, he made her like record. Well, he didn't make her, I guess, when they were together, like she did it for him. But uh, she recorded all these daily affirmations and he's still listening to them, even though she has subsequently left him. So we have that guy. Now, the other character we have is Wyatt. Now, these two were friends back in junior high, high school, something like that. They show like some pictures. They don't go a huge amount. There's not like a lot of, you know, exposition, but you pick things up from hints. You know what I mean? Like hints of things they say to one another, hints of like somebody finds like some old pictures or something like that. And you're kind of left to fill in the blanks of these, these dudes' friendship uh, from that, which I think was really good. So Wyatt uh, and Christian were best friends, you know, when they were kids. And like I said, they seem like they were both kind of dorky and whatever. Now, Wyatt, he seems to have fallen on some hard times. And you're never entirely sure because basically he's hanging out like on the sidewalk with his duffel bag or whatever. And he's kind of in front of Christian's building. And he makes it seem as though this is how it seemed to me. I'm not sure if that's ex in entirely what the implication was, but it seemed to me that he was just kind of like waiting there and he wanted to make it seem like coming across Christian was an accident because what has happened in Wyatt's life was that I guess he's like, he was in construction or something like that. And I think he lived in another state and he was also engaged to be married, but that also ended. And we're not entirely sure why, although I have some ideas about what might have happened there, but they never tell you. But uh, he's clearly at a time in his life where maybe he doesn't uh, have a home. So, but he doesn't want Christian to know this, I guess. So he kind of makes it seem like, oh, hey, I was just in town, like visiting somebody um, and they're not home yet. So I was just like waiting for them to get home. And Christian was like, oh no, man, like come up here and we'll catch up, you know, cause we haven't seen each other for such a long time. So it so happens that uh, Wyatt ends up staying uh, in Christian's apartment with Christian because, like I said, Christian is now by himself. So through the interaction of these two characters, you sort of get deeper into their pasts, more Christians than Wyatt's because Wyatt is very, he's very soft spoken. He's very, he's a little bit uh, socially awkward. Him and Christian kind of like the way they interact, you can tell that they were once like, you know, the closest friends. And the imp implication I got was that they were kind of like these dorks or misfits or something like that in junior high or high school or whenever it was. And they were kind of like their only, uh, each other's only friend uh, because they're very, very close. And when they first, when they meet up again at the beginning of the movie, it's really awkward because they haven't seen each other for a while, but very soon they fall back into patterns and like doing dorky stuff and like doing kid type stuff together, like drinking together, like playing a, uh, what's that game that they call it, where they like wrap up in the fucking uh, sleeping bags, blobby wars, and they're kind of like, fuck, and like making like geeky references and stuff. So they fall very much back into that pattern. However, Wyatt has some mental issues, possibly schizophrenia. Uh, they never say that outright. I mean, he does say that word, but... Uh, and you're led to believe that that's probably what it is. And the symptoms that he uh, shows in this movie are very much indicative of, of schizophrenia. He has come to the idea that the people around him, not everybody, but certain people are 
demons who look like people. And he believes that he is one of the blessed that has been chosen to fight them, to like prevent the end of the world. Now he has started getting this idea because he has a broken cell phone that he carries around with him. And every now and then he gets a call on the cell phone and there's like a creepy voice, which is sometimes the same, but sometimes it's the voice of like other people he meets like through the course of the movie. So he's kind of bringing them into his delusion. And he has these voices telling him, he's like, look, the demons are coming. That's not your friend. That's not your brother. Uh, it's one of them and you have to destroy them. And it's kind of like telling him all of the stuff that he's going to have to do to prevent the demons from taking over. So the great thing about this is that this is actually one of the best, I think it's one of the best portrayals of mental illness that I've seen on film because he doesn't, come across like a crazy person and he almost kind of comes across like he knows there's something the matter with him. He knows, but he can't help it. Like he can't, he's having a hard time like distinguishing what's real and what's not. And like, sometimes he seems totally fine and totally lucid. And like I said, he really, really seems to have an idea that other people might not be kosher with this or, you know, maybe there's something the matter with him or maybe it's just all silly or something like that. So it's really, they portrayed that really, really well, I think, because I know that there's kind of a thing where in a lot of horror movies, they do kind of say it's like, oh, this person has schizophrenia or this person's crazy or whatever. And it's like not portrayed with much uh, sensitivity or mu even much realism. This one is actually portrayed much more like a realistic portrayal of somebody with that uh, mental disorder. Um, and like I said, and he really does seem aware that he has a mental disorder, but he can't distinguish fact from fiction. And he's very, very frustrated that he can't. So he keeps getting these phone calls. And basically over the course of the movie, he's kind of like preparing for the war with the demons that he thinks that he has to fight. And so you see him going and like buying a big thing full of like axes and rope and things. And uh, then one of the voices on the phone tells him that uh, demons are susceptible to acid. So he goes and buys like some sulfuric acid and he pretty much sets up down in uh, like a basement or a storeroom of uh, Christian's house. And he's kind of like getting ready for the apocalypse down there. There's also something going on with Christian who, like I said, is still has that deep insecurity that he had when he was a kid, but now is just trying to mask it, you know, by like working out and, you know, being dominant and all this other kind of stuff. Um, and he has this crush on this, uh, on his boss at work, whose name is Mara. And he um, finally gets up the courage to ask her out. They go out, the date doesn't go very well, not because of their fault, but because uh, something happens and he ha he brings Wyatt along. And so she feels obligated to bring another friend of hers along. The friend like slips on the ice and breaks her ankle or something like that. So it's just this big, awkward, uh, you know, shit show. Uh, but Mara does seem to like Christian. Uh, so they do kind of, you know, get a little bit of a romance thing going there. But then it turns out that Mara has to be the one Christian thinks that he's being like all dominant and awesome at work and everything. But when he gets fired uh, and he's the only one in his department that does get fired, uh, he finds a note like on his uh, computer that says, you know, way to dominate asshole from everyone. So everyone is just like, thinks he's an obnoxious douche. Whereas he thought that he was being all confident and everything like that. And that really kind of takes the wind out of his sails. Also implied that he has um, a little bit of a drinking problem. No one says it outright, but it does seem like he's drinking a lot during the course of the movie. And um, that's another one of his coping mechanisms. So basically it gets to a point where Mara, after uh, she ends up firing Christian, obviously they, <laughs> they, there's like a little bit of a falling out there, but now it's like super awkward, but she feels bad. So she comes over to his house and, you know, they kind of hang out. And then Christian leaves the apartment and Wyatt is still in there with Mara. Um, they've met each other previously because of like the double date before. And at this point he has gotten, as I mentioned, remember I mentioned earlier that sometimes like whoever this person is that's calling on the cell phone, that sometimes it'll have a different voice. Well, prior to Mara showing up at the apartment, she has, he has gotten one of these, uh, Wyatt has gotten one of these phone calls and it was Mara's voice. 
So when Mara comes to the house, he thinks that she is another chosen person, like another blessed person who knows about the demons. So he takes her down to the basement to show him, to show her like the preparations he's making. He's like, you know, I need help. You know, what do I do? And all this other stuff. And she understandably flips the fuck out uh, because she thinks that he's going to flip out and hurt her. So after that, it's just like this big whole thing. Now, I wanted to say that like the best part of this is the end. This is so, okay, the whole thing throughout is just, like I said, it's it's basically, the heart of it is these two dudes' friendship. And, you know, Mara, and there's an, the other girl too, but she's only like in a scene or two, and I can't even remember what her name is. But Mara's kind of like a big character as well. Throughout the whole thing, you're never really shown, there's not any imagery in it that's really creepy. I mean, there's some creepy, creepy imagery, but it's like not big special effect monster, nothing like that. It's just sometimes when you see things through Wyatt's point of view, you'll see something like the person, he's talking to a person, and then he'll start hearing, you'll start hearing all this insect buzzing, like a whole bunch of flies buzzing. And when you hear that, you know that he thinks that this person is a demon. Now, sometimes that person just kind of stays looking normal, but sometimes that person starts looking, like, because one time he's talking to Mara and her fucking eyes go like that and like go white and then like her mouth starts getting really big and everything's because you're seeing things from his point of view and it's super super creepy so there's like the best thing about this movie that makes this movie so creepy is not so much like the upsetting imagery even though some of the imagery is unsettling but it's just like this sense of dread that just kind of like pervades it because you don't know what Wyatt is going to see and because he's such a good character and he's a likable character and you feel bad for him and you empath you empathize with him a lot and you empathize with his uh you know with his friendship this deep friendship that he has with Christian so you just so it's just like this real it it just kind of pulls your emotions like in every direction because it's like you know that he can't help it but then on the other hand you know that he's dangerous and he doesn't want to be dangerous he's only dangerous because of what he believes and he can't help believing that because he has a mental illness i mean at one point like he goes up to the you know roof of uh, christian's house with a nail gun and he's like looking at like he's going to shoot people or then he's going to do it to himself or something like that so it's just this everything is just like super super tense and you really really feel bad for the guy because you know that he can't help it and he's just and a lot of times he's just a normal dude but he has all of this shit going on in his head and he can't you know help feeling like that he can't help believing the things that he believes which like i said um make him dangerous to everyone around him because the voices on the phone are telling him that you know it could be anybody like any one of your friends could be a demon you know even though they look like they're your friend so the very last scene finally Wyatt confesses to Christian about the, you know, the, the demon thing that's coming. And Christian at this point is just kind of like, fuck it, because, you know, he got fired from his job, he's drunk and everything. He's, and so he decides he's kind of going to go along with it. Like, he's just sort of like, okay, well, what do we do? You know, you, let me help you with it. And there's a great scene, because at first they're going to like run off, they're going to go somewhere and, and then that doesn't work out. And then, so he takes Christian down to the basement and he's like, you know, this is where I've been preparing for the war or whatever. He, he's like, and I'm not sure if you're one of them. And so Christian, fucking, I love this. He says, well, if you're not sure that I'm a demon, then you got to tie me up. And so Wyatt is just kind of like, okay. So he ties him up. He puts tape over his mouth. He puts a bag over his head because he's had this idea from like the phone conversations that the Armageddon or whatever, like all the demons are going to take over um, at a certain time, like at 6 p.m. or whatever. Like, and he had to hear three peals of thunder or something like that. And that happens. So he's just kind of like, okay, well, now's the time. The final scene is just so, so great because it's just so tense. The lights go out. And it's just like Christian is sitting there in the chair tied up with a bag over his. He can't see anything and he can't talk. And Wyatt is just standing there like with the acid, just kind of like that, like hoping that it's not a demon. And he could see like in his mind, he's seeing like weird shapes, like moving under the bag as though Christian is transforming. And in the end, like I said, I am going to spoil the end, so don't be mad at me. I told you this a long time ago. 
in the end, he almost pours it. He almost pours it because he just can't. And it keeps, he sees the shapes in the bag and he's just like, oh shit. And he sees all this other kind of stuff. And then in the end, he doesn't pour it. He decides he's going to trust his friend over his hallucinations, which he doesn't know are hallucinations. When he takes the bag off, Christian is normal. And that seems like it's almost kind of, I don't say, you know, it obviously it doesn't cure his schizophrenia, but it sort of like startles him out of his illusion. And the fact that Christian trusted Wyatt enough, knowing that Wyatt believed he might be a demon, knowing that he might kill him. But the fact that, that Christian was actually willing to just sit there and almost get killed and maybe possibly get killed to try and show that he wasn't a demon was just a great fucking, it was just, I just loved the ending of this so much because it's just, I really loved the fact that you could see the depth of these two guys friendship that they trusted each other to that extent. And just the fact that Christian did that. And it was good for him too, because he was kind of like, he made a crack earlier on that he was going to, after he got fired, he's like, Oh, I'm going to join the army because I always felt like if somebody pointed a gun at my face or if I was going to die, I would just like piss my pants and I want to get over that. And so the fact that he sat there and he could have died because Wyatt could very well have killed him, and he almost did, kind of got him over his fear and like made him more confident as well. I just love this movie so much. I just think it's, it, it just goes to show what somebody with a vision can do with like very little money and just like a few characters. If you have a good story like this, if you have these actors who are just willing to commit, and like I said, their relationships are just so natural. And I really, really liked that this really had a really big heart to it. I mean, the the two guys' friendship, I think, even if it hadn't been, even if there hadn't been like creepy, you know, kind of imagery in it, I would have watched a movie just about their friendship just because it was just so genuine and so heartfelt. And in turn, that made the creepy stuff way creepier because like I said, you you understood that that's the way he was seeing the world and he couldn't help it, but it was making him dangerous to everybody that loved him. And that was like really tragic. But then I really, really liked that the ending was uplifting. Now it's weird because I've seen some reviews of this where people said, well, they leave it ambiguous as to whether why it was right. Maybe people, you know, maybe it was like invasion of the body snatchers and like demons or aliens or whatever really were taking people over. So he was right about it. I don't know if I, I guess I can see that, but I'm pretty sure that at the end, like that end scene, I'm pretty sure they were implying that he was schizophrenic and was just seeing the world like that. I don't think that it was meant to imply that the demons were real or what he was saying, uh, seeing was real. Um, I guess you could read it that way if you wanted to, but I did not get that impression just because of a few things that happened like during the last scene, because, you know, some of the things that he saw, like, you know, when he kind of snapped out of it later, like weren't really there. So I definitely think that they were implying that it was his mental illness that I don't think that, I don't think there was any real demons or anything, but you know, like I said, if you want to read it that way, you totally can. But yeah, this was again, just a really, really great creepy, unsettling, like psychological horror that had a really lot of heart to it, which you don't see in a lot of horror movies. So I definitely, definitely recommend it. If that sounds like uh, your kind of thing, because I know some people would be like, oh, it's not a horror movie. Oh, it's too slow. Blah, 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 blah. I know there's that whole thing. But if this kind of thing is your cup of tea and you haven't seen it, because I don't really see a ton of people talking about it, um, flew a little bit under the under the radar, unfortunately, because it's really, really good. Um, but yeah, it's on Tubi now uh, for free if you want to watch it. I believe it's also on Amazon Prime if you want to watch it on there. I'm not sure if it's on Netflix anymore. It used to be, but I, at least in the US, I don't think it is. I would definitely recommend it. It's a great psychological thriller. And it's just, as I said, one of, one of the best depictions, the most sensitive depictions of uh, mental illness I think I've ever seen in, in the fact that they don't demonize it or they don't make him seem like a crazy person. You know what I mean? They really like threaded that needle uh, very well, I thought. Uh, Perry Blackshear has gone on, this was actually his first movie, amazingly. Uh, he's gone on to make a couple more. I think there's one called The Siren, which I keep seeing, I, I keep seeing it on like Amazon Prime or something like that. And I didn't realize that it was the same guy that had done it. So I'm definitely gonna have to watch that one eventually as well. But yeah, I definitely check this one out and uh, I will see you guys on the next one. Bye.